This is Barry Zalma speaking for Claim School Incorporated with True Crimes of Insurance Fraud. I present these videos so you can learn how insurance fraud is perpetrated and what is necessary to deter or defeat insurance fraud. This video blog of true crime stories of insurance fraud this being number 16 of the series, with the names and places changed to protect the guilty are all based upon investigations conducted by me and fictionalized to create a learning environment for claims personnel, SIU investigators, insurers, police, and lawyers to better understand insurance fraud and the weapons that can be used to deter or defeat a fraudulent insurance claim. In this story called Go Directly to Jail, the insured had no respect for his insurance company. He expected them to pay any claim he presented. He expected no investigation. Other members of the same immigrant community had successfully committed arson for profit fraud. It was so easy for others he decided to burn his house down. The insured thought he was highly intelligent. He planned his arson fire carefully. He arranged for his wife and children to spend the weekend with their cousins in Oakland. He got four one-gallon cans of gasoline from four different gas stations over a two-week period. He stored the gasoline in his garage. He told his wife and children he would join them Sunday because he had work to do Saturday at his business. After driving the wife and children to their cousin's home in Oakland, he returned to his home in San Francisco that Friday night. Early Saturday morning, he began the preparations for the fire. He removed all of the valuable contents of the house and stored them in a rented storage facility. He packed up all of his good clothing in a suitcase and put them in the trunk of his automobile. He checked the neighborhood and found a house for rent in his general neighborhood, similar to the house he lived in. He made arrangements with the owner and signed a month-to-month -month lease on the house. He did not notice that the owner recorded the date and time the lease was signed. The insured spoke on the telephone with three of his customers. He visited one to show that he had, in fact, worked in his business of selling imported bathing suits that day. He then waited for the sun to set. After it was completely dark, the insured removed one of the gasoline cans from the garage and spread the gasoline carefully throughout his living room and dining room. He returned to the garage, deposited the empty can in its hiding place, and then removed two more cans. He spread them in two bedrooms and the kitchen. He made certain while he was spreading the gasoline that the windows and doors of the house remained open to keep enough oxygen available for the fire to spread. He did not turn on any lights for fear of a spark. He had turned off the pilot light on all the gas appliances. He spread the last can of gasoline around the front entry, the den, and the two bathrooms. The insured did not notice as he poured the gasoline, small droplets splashed on his shirt. He made a final walk through the house to satisfy himself that he had spread the gasoline everywhere. There was nothing of value remaining in the house. He stood at the rear entrance and rolled up a newspaper. He lit the newspaper with his cigarette lighter and threw it into the kitchen. The gasoline had been in the kitchen for a considerable time, and the fumes ignited almost instantaneously throughout the house. The flash of flames brushed the insured and ignited it. He ran from the scene, ripping his shirt off his body. He suffered only minor burns to his chest and back. Half naked, he ran down the street in the dark to a nearby BART station, where he caught a train to Oakland. He spent the evening with his family. The next morning, he called the San Francisco Fire Department. He told the investigator he had chased the arsonist out of his house 
all the way to Montgomery Street only to lose him at a BART station. He explained because he was exhausted, burned, and half-naked, he decided to go to his cousin's home and spend a quiet night before calling the fire department. The insured reported to his insurer the next day. He reported that the fire gutted his house. He told him he had placed his family in a rental house. He demanded an advance payment to cover the expense of the rental house. The insured had moved his family into the rental dwelling, knowing that his policy provided coverage for additional living expenses. It was the new rental dwelling that he first met with the adjuster. The insured told the adjuster, quote, I came home after a late dinner to find my front door open. I believed that a burglary had occurred. I was not afraid since I had served in the Soviet Army in Afghanistan before coming to the United States. I walked quietly into my dark house. I could see that my television set and stereos were missing and heard someone in the back bedrooms. I approached the bedroom as quietly as possible. As I was about to see the burglar, they splashed me with something that smelled like gasoline. A dark figure ran past me and I chased him down the hallway and as he was leaving out my back door, he threw a match and the kitchen burst into flames. My shirt caught fire where he had splashed me and I ripped it off. Half naked, I kept running after him down the street and into the city. I chased him for at least ten blocks, but he outran me and never got a good look at him. He was about six foot two, thin, and I think he might have been black. My chest was burned. I was half naked, and I knew my house was in flames. There was nothing I could do. I saw a BART station nearby, and I bought a token and took the train to my cousin's house in Oakland. My cousin's house is only two blocks from the station, and I spent the night with my family there. When I returned to San Francisco, we found the house destroyed. I rented this house so my family could have a place to sleep. The adjuster empathized with the insured. He made clear to the insured that the policy covered additional living expenses and advances would be made as soon as possible. The adjuster promised to start his investigation immediately. He asked for documents to support the claim for additional living expenses, including the lease agreement signed by the insured. <clears throat> the San Francisco Fire Department's arson unit investigated the fire. It found the fire to be clearly an arson fire. The arson unit assumed the fire was set to cover a burglary. They believed the insured story about confronting and chasing the robber. There was no question that the insured was burned as a result of the fire. The insured claimed, among other things, that he had lost in the fire 400 bathing suits and 600 pairs of pajamas. He informed the adjusters that the bathing suits and pajamas had been part of the inventory of the business that he had closed down months before and that they were no longer for sale. He said they were used by his family and friends. He had already researched the chance that the insurer would refuse coverage for these items if they were business personal property. He made it clear to the adjuster that they were not business property. The adjuster was suspicious. He initially accepted the insured's word. He found it necessary, however, to complete the thorough investigation required by the California Fair Claim Settlement Practices regulations to obtain evidence that the insured's claims were correct and supported by substantial evidence. His first interview, therefore, was with the landlord of the replacement dwelling. The landlord showed him the original lease, which, unlike the copy in the hands of the insured, noted that he signed it at 11.30 a.m. on the Saturday before the fire. The adjuster questioned the landlord carefully in that regard, since the fire was reported to have occurred at 10.12 p.m. the same night, or 11 hours after the insured signed the lease for the replacement house. 
The landlord was adamant. He was a meticulous bookkeeper and always wrote down the date and time each lease he entered into was signed. He also remembered that the insured told him he needed the house furnished because it was a replacement for his house which had burned in a fire. From that point, the truth was easy to prove. The insurer is required by the California Insurance Code reported its findings to the local fire arson investigators and provided them with copies of the lease and the statement obtained from the landlord. The fire investigators arrested the insured. He was tried and convicted of arson and insurance fraud, and the court sentenced the insured to six years in state prison. The insured was not arrested because of brilliant investigation and police work. He was arrested because he had so little respect for the insurer and the police that he covered none of his trails. He told a story that was almost impossible to believe. He rented a house to replace his burned-out house before it had been destroyed in the fire. From his own statements and actions, he established motive, opportunity, ability, and premeditation. He was so stupid in perpetrating this crime that even a novice adjuster who did the minimum investigation discovered the crime. Arson is, of course, a very dangerous crime where people are burned to death, including firefighters. And it is a crime that should never, never be granted probation or kindness by a judge or jury. This video was adapted from my book, Insurance Fraud Costs Everyone, which is available as a Kindle book and a paperback from Amazon.com. Thank you for your attention.